Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're a little slower on the Pacific time on the West Coast, but it is morning, and some of us have had at least one cup of coffee, if not two, and done a walk, et cetera, et cetera. But today, um, we're going to focus on measuring the work of our grantees and support staff. And we have as our facilitators, uh, Rachel, Janine, and uh, Tara, who are going to uh, walk you through the CTEC uh, data collection, and that will be Tara, as well as the K-12 Strong Workforce uh, data collection. And then at the end, talk a little bit about some of the troubleshooting and next steps and what you can expect. So with that, let me turn it over to, I think it's Janine that's going to start. Actually, I think we're going to turn it Actually over to Rachel start. to kick us off. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. Um, I, I am eager to get this conversation started. I know we've had kind of questions about it throughout the last couple of days. Um, so thank you for being here. I'm going to be presenting again as uh, Lila mentioned with Janine Kaiser and Tara Nelson from CDE. Janine's also a consultant and um, supporting the West Ed team. Uh, I wanted to start just to, by sharing how sincerely thankful I am for all the work that you all are doing to support students. Um, this is such an incredibly hectic time in communities. Uh, so I just really appreciate the work you're doing to support the, the students and the communities that you're from. Um, it's really important that we're creating equitable pathways right now. Uh, and these living wage jobs are going to be more important than ever as we're coming out of this pandemic as well as this unrest that we're in. So I just want to um, thank you before we do anything else. Um, the next um, slide, Janine, it was really, I wanted to start here um, because a lot of times when we're thinking about data, we're not thinking about the question of what our strengths are with our pathways. What is it that we really want to talk about when we're, when we're collecting the data? What story do we want to tell? So if you don't mind in the chat, if you could answer this question, what word um, would you use if you, is one, one word to describe the biggest strengths of your pathway? If you're in a perspective of um, being a regional um, coordinator or a chair, um, you're looking at the aggregate of all your pathways, but if you're on the ground level or direct staff or, or in, in teaching, tell us what you think you're doing well. Relationships, transparency, teachers, of course, collaboration, internships, inclusiveness, innovation. Oh, I love these. Inspiring, living wage, healthcare pathways, equity, partnerships, collaboration, communication, industry partnerships. Oh, these are great. I'm so happy that you all are feeling like you have these kind of strengths because this is where we want to position this conversation, um, really thinking about how do we use data to support the strengths of your program and where you can grow. Um, we welcome any other comments here. So if you want to keep going, if you haven't said it, we're, we'll still have them in our notes. Um, I'm going to move forward though. Thank you, um, Janine. Will you advance. So today we we're going to uh, just move through this agenda, um, starting on the nuts and bolts of data collection. But we also want to talk about the role that data plays to grow and strengthen the pathways. We know that data isn't everyone's favorite topic, especially on day three of a, of a day long webinars that we've been on. Um, and there's so much nuance in students' journeys that we are really hard pressed to capture in quantitative um, data. So um, we know there are challenges, but we also know that um, by using this data carefully and thoughtfully, you can tell a, a more complete story about what's going on. Um, we have been thoughtful about how we're trying to measure the work so we can complement the LEA data collection from the grantees, um, the K-12 pathway coordinators, and the TAPS. Um, Janine's going to talk more about the K-12 strong workforce um, interim measures, and Tara will share a bit more about the CTIG perspective. But we're hoping to really understand the the the, the picture of the data that we need to kind of uh, move to the chancellor's office and CDE and um, also nest that inside of a larger story about what's going on on the ground. Can you move the next slide, please? So obviously compliance is really important. We, we understand that that's where we kind of all live and breathe 
Um, and we think about compliance when we, at least when, we, when Jean and I were talking about how we wanted to frame this, we thought that's usually how people think about data, right? We, we think about what we have to do to report to the funders or policymakers, um, really this idea of complying with the law and the contracts. So it's, it can feel a little bit um, like a, a dutiful um, part of our work. Um, and it's useful to tell uh, our story basically, or our data back to reporting purposes. But the framework of compliance doesn't really support the creative thinking that we need to capture, um, to understand what's going on with our students and with our programs and our pathways. So we want to we want to kind of explore this idea um, in this session about continuous improvement. We're going to get back to it kind of after we get through the nuts and bolts. But from a continuous improvement mindset, data can look pretty different. It, it moves out from being the chore and more interesting. It's it's um kind of a journey I've been on the last maybe number of years, maybe the last ten years, of understanding that by using data strategically and thoughtfully, we can learn together and uh, work um, together on growing our programs in ways that feel uh, cohesive and, and strategic. It can also help support our professional development strategies. Um, we can define, define where our status and progress are of the pathways that we have um, built and developed. We can identify new areas where we wanna grow new pathways. We can target resources more strategically when we use data for both technical assistance, peer support, obviously resources for teachers and students. Um, one important part that we wanna make sure that we're thinking about is how do we connect with the labor market more strategically and how data can be so important for us to know who and where to connect with to make it more real for students into um, living wage jobs. Um, and ultimately it can just help us demonstrate how effective our pathways are and um, where we have areas that we can grow. Um, I think we have a lot of really compelling um, uh, stories on the ground. We want, we're gonna highlight one from the Bay Area later. But uh, after we kind of through nuts and bolts, we wanna really try to move out of this idea of compliance and try to think about how, how can this data help you all grow and uh, strengthen programs from here on out. Um, this, the next slide is just, a, actually, a, there's an updated slide in your, in your deck, but this is, the idea here, we're going to be covering um, both the CTIG and the um, and the strong workforce data today. Um, we have much more a deeper dive into this later on with your your K fourteen taps. Um, they've been given a bit more information. We're just going to try to keep this at a higher level just to discuss uh, what we're trying to collect, and then we can get into details. Um, uh, likely post webinar, but we certainly have a lot more information we can share with you after the call. Okay, let's, um, you wanna move to, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Janine. She's gonna talk about the data sets that we're talking through for the uh, K-12 Strong Workforce Interim Measures. Okay, and uh, thanks everybody. Um, and thanks for that introduction, Rachel. Um, so my name is Janine Kaiser. As Rachel mentioned, um, I uh, have been supporting this project um, and some of the um, key talent um, as folks have onboarded over the last few months, um, or in some cases, many months. Um, I uh, came to this work because I was a former K-14 TAP under the old framework. Um, and so I had a lot of experience working closely with data, both from a compliance and also from a continuous improvement perspective. And so I'm hopeful um, that what we share with you today resonates well um, from that lens, um, or it makes sense from that lens. Um, so I just wanted to share my background to make sure you understood where I was coming from in some of these comments. Um, so first thing to say is that um, we're gonna give a thumbnail today to Rachel's point about the interim measures. Um, and so first we're gonna talk about the um, interim measures from the various um, uh, perspectives of reporting. So we're gonna talk about LEA grantees from K-12 Strong Workforce. We're then gonna talk about um, pathway coordinators and then third, TAPS. But one thing to say first is that um, we, uh, um, we are, uh, the, the focus of these measures is, is not to, um, is to share high level points about what K-12 strong workforce funding is touching. Um, it is less about specifics of student transitions and specifics of um, sort of uh, types of interventions that folks are using on, in the field. Um, and so, uh, what we're trying to do is roll up 
to quantifiable broad strokes views on what these grant funds are helping to do in the field um, in support of students' journeys. But we're gonna see, what you'll see in a moment is that these are not terribly specific measures. Um, and so uh, first thing I'll talk about briefly is that, um, is pardon me, the LEA grantee perspective. Um, and so there are really three buckets of types of um, information we're gonna be requesting that will be requested um, from the LEA grantees in this first reporting cycle. Um, one is types of activities supported. Um, we know that particularly in round one grantees, there is a huge array of types of activities that are being supported by K-12 Strong Workforce Funds. Um, what we're trying to do is create a little bit of a crosswalk between grant cycles to understand and, and flesh out some of the kinds of activities that folks are doing. Um, within this, I should also say that LEA grantees um, every, every LEA that is receiving funds will be reporting, not only the grant leads. Um, and so we're hopeful that by um, enabling um, folks that are closest to the work to report directly, um, we'll get a little bit more specificity and nuance in the kinds of activities that are underway within, with these funds. So these are categorical. People will be able to check boxes for all that apply. Um, and it's really to help us, again, crosswalk between um, grant, grant, around, grant round one, grant round two, and then also um, uh, add a little bit of a nuance and quantifiable information about the kinds of work that's happening relative to these funds. The second bucket is around trying to understand the, um, the scale of students touched um, through K-12 Strong Work or with K-12 Strong Work for, work for K-12 Strong Workforce Program funds um, in aggregate um, around certain pathways, um, around the pathways themselves. Um, and so what we're asking for is actually information about the pathways um, from each LEA. So each LEA that received K-12 Strong Workforce funds will re be reporting back information about the, um, the, the courses that are involved in the pathway, um, and then some details about the types of, of um, uh, information about the pathway itself, like are these courses sequenced? Um, are these courses involving um, dual enrollment or articulation credit? Um, we um, hope with this information to then connect it to public information to, um, or we, we will connect it to public information to get a sense of scale of students touched. Again, this is not a progression story. This is not talking about the number of students that, individual students that are moving through, but again, again a broader stroke, a uh, broader base strokes, a uh, broader strokes base of information. The third focus of the question, uh, questions for this first round of reporting um, is around early college credit. Um, and so we will be asking about information um, relative to the scale of students involved in various forms of early college credit. And we'll be doing that through course codes as well. Um, each of these buckets um, will be fleshed out and shared um, more, with more detail via the K-14 TAPS um, in the coming weeks. Um, and uh, there are, there, there are, you'll see when you see the questions that there's more specificity to them. This is a big thumbnail. Um, but what I wanna say is just that we um, spent a lot of time connecting with LEA grantees to, to test some of these concepts and um, uh, to test the way that we ask the questions as well as the um, uh, approach to these questions. And there was responsiveness and, and um, uh, uh, I think a good response to the way that we went about doing this, both balancing um, the burden on the field and the benefit to our understanding of the impact of this grant. Um, second, and I know I'm a little over time, so I'm gonna try to go more quickly on the next two. Um, so I'm gonna uh, move through. So as we move into these different ty types of reporting, K-12 um, K pathway coordinators will also be um, uh, asked to report information. Um, and it connects very closely to the work plans for K-12 pathway coordinators and also tracks back and, and reinforces information that we have from the LEAs directly about their pathways. Um, and so you'll see here, there's a focus on um, sort of engagement that the K-12 pathway coordinators have done and then um, around specific pathways. So understanding um, needs um, of those pathways. And then within those pathways that have been connected with as of the reporting time, um, trying to understand more information about the details of the nature of connection between, and as many of you spoke to in your or original comments on um, the icebreaker activity, is collaboration between the community college and the, and the K-12 um, uh, LEA. Um, so trying to understand the nature of that connection. Is there a strong connection and what does that look like? Is there early college credit? Is there, are there pathway mechs? Is there 
curricular alignment, et cetera. And then the third element is around challenges LEAs are experiencing. Um, and so having a, a free answer place for um, pathway coordinators to help reflect some of the things they're hearing from the ground. Um, and then the last element um, that I want to speak to is the K-14 TAPs themselves. Um, so K-14 TAPs um, will also be asked to report um, information. All of this will be collected in NOVA and rolled up and available. Um, the, um, again, the, there is a connection and a thread through each, each of these um, in which um, reporting from the LEAs as well as the pathway coordinators as well as the TAPs track along the same themes. Um, the TAPs focus of reporting is really about how they're supporting the pathway coordinators and the field with professional development um, and ensuring that there's um, um, progress against work plans. Um, and, uh, and then also there's a free answer portion relative to challenges the PCs might be experiencing. Um, around uh, work in the field, again, for continuous improvement and understanding for the Chancellor's Office and others. Um, let me pause there um, and uh, ask if there are questions um, before we move on. I know I'm over time, so we'll try to go quickly here, sorry. There's been a couple, Janine, I'm just gonna field them if you all can put them in the chat so we don't um, open up too wide here. Um, there was a question about how the course codes um, are collected for dual enrollment meaning the CD data? Correct, so um, we are gonna ask LEAs to report which codes they are using for dual enrollment. So for the courses that they are offering as duly enrolled, um, we know that there are, and they're introducing um, CalPADS codes this year um, for dual enrollment, or have an introduced this year for dual enrollment. Um, at the same time, that may not be evenly implemented yet within the LEAs, and so we're asking sites to report which codes those, those are um, within their um, local taxonomy. Um, and, and also articulation, some challenges around articulation, but we're trying to capture articulation as well. Yes, that's right. And then the other question about if the LEA had to attach the CTIG self-assessment to their strong workforce application, isn't that, is that information already available? Isn't it? Question mark. Um, so I think that that information is available. Um, it is a little bit different than what we are tracking here um, in these, because this, this is really more um, quantified um, around um, the number of students impacted and the number of courses um, affected, pathways affected um, through these grant funds. Um, and so the CTIG assessment um, was, uh, is, is a little bit more of a qualitative view um, that does have numbers attached to it. Um, I think they're complementary, but not the same. Um, there's also a question about if there are, um, uh, if the, the data collecting is just for those that are supported by CT and, and strong workforce. Correct. These are, these are those pathways directly supported by K-12 strong workforce program. Maybe we'll just take one more about the question about middle school. Um, how are we supposed to report middle school codes since um, they, are, they are not CTE specific? So we have space. Um, so we recognize that there is going to be a range of what pathways look like. And there may be pieces and parts of pathways that are not CTE in these grants. Um, and so it is very flexible. The way that the interface will look is to um, write in, to type in the codes that do, are relevant to the, each pathway. So it, um, it will be flexible. It will allow for that. Um, uh, and then on the back end, there will be analysis around what that looks like. Great. I think we can move forward. Okay, and then um, very briefly, just want to walk through a rough sense of timing. Um, so I know a, lo a lot of this is still um, in flux, um, specifically around uh, when reporting will be due. Um, there, we anticipate having more significant guidance soon. Um, so uh, over the past, this is just to reflect where we've been. Um, we, we gathered a lot of stakeholder input from LEA leaders that had received K-12 strong workforce in some districts as a small um, sort of interview process. We then checked in with key, key talent that were in, pr in place um, and regional consortia for input on the measures, um, as well as the Chancellor's Office. So there's been a lot of stakeholder input to date. Um, right now, we are in a stage of preparing NOVA. Um, and so the um, 
the interface for collection of this information is through Nova, similar to the application process. Um, and uh, their, their product ops within the chancellor's office is now currently building um, or will be in the process of building soon um, that interface. Um, the, the hope and intention is to have that interface be live as soon as possible, um, targeting July. Um, and then with measures due um, in September, but there's some caveats around exactly the date yet. So um, we are awaiting guidance um, on what that will look like specifically, but it will be coming in the early fall will be the deadlines for these information and there will be the ability to collect information um, in the summertime. Yes, this is late breaking, Janine. Um, uh, we, we did talk about, um, I think Sandra and Lila shared September 30th as the date. Okay. Sorry, I have a typo. I just included it. You could see um, <laughs> I did a 020. Um, and that um, their report to the legislature is in November. Great. Um, and all of these interim measures are leading up to inform that report as well, as well as development of the field or for information about the field. Any questions? So there's a, a comment question here. K-12 districts are being held more accountable to CT completer outcomes through the PSTS report, help them access student outcomes data through EDD or CalPAS Plus. It would be a great, great nice way to build a better partnership. Um, it would be great. Um, and I think that the focus in this, um, in sort of this portion of our discussion is really on this compliance interface, which is more, is a sort of a step back from that. Um, yes, not quite there yet. Not quite there yet. Um, all right, so how will the announcement come out once NOVA interface is ready? Um, so uh, stay tuned. Um, the Chancellor's Office will be um, advising regional consortia um, when that is available. And then I'm going to lean on Lila um, and Sandra, if she's on the line, um, to so, so be more specific about what that will look like. There's also a question about CapCast um, Plus training. Yeah, and we're going to get into that very briefly um, a little bit farther down the road. That's not the scope of today's conversation, but I agree with you. It's super interesting, and I think it would be great to have a training on that at some point. But we'll talk about that at a very surface level in a few minutes. We certainly um, need to address and, and plan to um, do NOVA training for folks, for sure. Tara, are you on the line? Are you ready to, to take over um, the next slide being on CTA? Sure. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so CTIG data collection, uh, we just finished going through uh, the last round. It ended in January, uh, January uh, 30th. There was some data collection. So um, the main thing here is the items that are listed here. A lot of this you can already collect when um, you have all of your CalPads uh, codes inputted incorrectly. So the first step really is to be making sure that those are correct, that they're for the correct uh, course, um, concentrator, capstone, um, having a difference there. Those are some of the common things that we see um, about the coding, um, just making sure that, uh, that they're coded properly. Um, and then, let's see, so this first slide, I believe you can industry recognize you can get from your CalPAS data, but then there's also the, um, the survey. Um, so the survey has you collect um, some of this data, and I think even on the second slide, on the next slide, is there more? Yes, there's one more. Yeah, yeah there, there we go. Okay, so um, on this on this slide here, this is um, the data that's going to actually ask you ask the LEAs to do more of a manual thing um, right now. Uh, so usually that's done in the form of an exit survey, and then some follow up data. Um, my experience has is, is, um, shown that in some area, in some LEAs, the exit survey isn't very specific to CTE, and so uh, you'll find that many CTE teachers are having to um, call students and find students and doing a lot more work on that end to get you um, the post-secondary information, if you will. Um, 
so uh, it's just um, the exit survey just needs to be a little bit more inclusive of CTE um, and the kinds of questions that are being asked here because that is what's going to be asked on the survey that you'll be asked to report back. Um, otherwise, you know, it's a pretty, you know, as far as collecting the data, a lot of it, like I said, is CalPads and this other part is the survey. It's basically two parts for the data collection. Is there any questions? There was one question here, um, Tara, say, uh, asking, I understand that this is not a duplicate account. For example, a student at a post-secondary institution and working in a medical office only counts for one. Is that correct? Um, I'm going to have to get back to you on that one because that is a good question as to how we want to count that. But I will have to get back to you. Great. Great. I will, um, I'll send you, it's, it's Elizabeth's question and I'll make sure you get it. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Um, can dual enrollment courses be coded as capstone courses for CalPads? Are they being used for as a capstone? Can can dual enrollment courses be coded as capstone courses for CalPads? But are they being? In. But are they, yeah, I think yes. I believe the question is that they're they are the capstone classes. Can they be coded for? that use in cow pads. So this Again, is I'll have to get back. Go yeah, ahead. I think the determination is if they are used as a capstone course. It has been my experience that most of the dual enrollment is not a capstone course, but rather the transition, the bridge to the community college. But if there was a course that truly there was agreed upon um, criteria that it met the capstone criteria could be could be used then in that capacity. But that would be a local determination. I, this is uh, Denise in Imperial County. I think that's a question with regards to CalPads and the college and career indicator. Um, and it's my mm -hmm. understanding if Lori Morton just put it in the chat that according to CDE, you cannot use dual enrollment as a, cap as a capstone for the yeah. college and career indicator. So if we're talking about CCI, that's the rule there. But if, if we're looking at other ways to track data apart from the CCI, I don't know if that was the question, if it was specific to CCI or if it was different. Okay. There's a question about if military entry, including academies are counted. Military academies. I know that that question is is asked. If they if they enter the military, is that considered? In yes, it is. That is something that is asked. Um, if they have gone into the military, so that would be another indicator. Anything else? All right, well, I will get back to you on some of these other things that you asked about. Thank you. Can you advance the next slide, Janine? So from here, um, we have about have an hour left and what we wanted to do was talk through how data has helped uh, you grow or strengthen your area or region um, and we want to start by sharing have in the field um, Sharon Turner's on the call from the Bay Area region hi can you hear me Hi, Sharon. Sorry, my my um, Wi-Fi is 
not what it should be. So I'm um, sorry if I'm cutting out. Um, Sharon's going to sh- share an example from the field that um, thought we could kind of frame this conversation that we're going to have in our breakout groups. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rachel. Can you go to the next slide, please? Great. So thanks for having me here. Um, Rachel and Janine asked me to talk a little bit about how data has been used Um, in the Bay Region in um, a way to help advance K-14 pathways. And one example of that is in working with uh, the high schools and community college in Santa Cruz County, Cabrillo College. Uh, They pulled together a meeting with CT faculty at the high school and also the college because there was an agreement that um, both the high schools and the colleges were creating their pathways in silos and they wanted to um, work together to change that and really be able to look at the labor market data and reflect the job need. Um, So we looked at some K-14 transitions. Uh, We were able to get some data from CalPlus Plus, and actually Janine Kaiser on this call was very instrumental in helping to put this data together, along with Karen Beltramo, who at the time worked for our regional consortium, is now at West Ed. We were able to take the data from CalPlus CalPlus Plus, looking at what students um, were doing on the high school side who were in CTE programs and also looking at students who were not in CTE programs and then seeing um, what did that reflect? What did we see on the college side? So you can see really briefly here that um, the number of students that were enrolled in pathways versus the number of students that were not enrolled in pathways and how they, uh, what the numbers were for then enrolling in college after high school graduation within one year. And there is um, a slight advantage to students who are uh, enrolled in pathways. So that was really exciting. And then you can see on the right hand side of the column, uh, the number of students who were in pathways that completed 30 units within two years versus students that uh, were not in CT pathways. So again, that there was an advantage to students being in pathways. And so this was really exciting and compelling data for both um, really for high school teachers to see and also um, to partner with their community colleges. And just to follow up, uh, since this presentation, which was a little over a year ago, the high school faculty and college faculty in Santa Cruz County have continued to meet and really build pathways based on data. And one specific that came out of this meeting is uh, there was a realization there was a need for more biotech employees in Santa Cruz County. So the high school was able to come up with a set of courses that worked in a biotech related pathway to then transition into the community college. And they wound up even pulling in uh, UC Santa Cruz, a four-year university, so that students could um, continue the pathway into the four-year as well. And that is it for me. Thank you. So Sharon, how did this prompt other conversations? So you described kind of what other work has happened. Was there other data that that was um, either collected or or planned to be collected after you found this out? What did it prompt? um, What additional questions did it prompt? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, labor market data was was a big one. And that was definitely newer for high school faculty to look at. Um, So there was a lot of discussion that happened at at that level. What is the actual job need? And then building on pathways that go across the high school and the community college. Um, as far as other data, uh, I think um, there was an interest in, in really digging in and seeing how many students are enrolled, what pathways um, actually exist at the high school level. So mapping out those pathways and seeing how many students are in them and then being able to um, talk about what, the, what currently exists at the community college or could exist um, and then bringing in the four year as well. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, Sharon. Does anyone have specific questions for Sharon? People are, are liking this slide a lot, so thank you for sharing it. Yeah, well, thanks to Janine, who mm-hmm. really created it. Wonderful. So we wanted to frame this um, inspiration. Thank you, Sharon. Um, uh, as you all do some brief breakouts, we, we wanted to have folks go um, 
be able to talk with each other about how data is being used where you are, uh, either sharing some practices that you think um, we could learn from. If you're new to this conversation, um, if you could advance, Jeanine, sorry, as, a, as the questions here. Um, or it doesn't, I'm not sure. Um, the questions being, do you have uh, examples of data and how they've impacted and continuous improvement? and or a question around what data resources you wish you knew more about. So the question um, here being, if you're brand new to this conversation or feel as though you're not quite sure what you need, um, that's a welcomed conversation as well. Um, we're just gonna do this conversation for about uh, 10 minutes. And if you can choose a couple points to report out in the chat when we reconvene, we're just gonna have a brief conversation. We just kind of wanna, uh, move the energy around a little um, around this this data use and specifically you might want to talk about how the data that we're talking about today could be used if that's helpful um, but certainly um, we feel like we have a lot to learn across um, our, our k-12 community college industry um, partnerships to, to use in, and data to drive um, changes in learning so um, let me, we're gonna do a breakout. Um, you, this is random so you're gonna end up in a room with six or seven people we're not assigning roles um, per se, but if you could hang in here for a few minutes with us and just um, discuss these questions and, and uh, see what you can generate as far as ideas and thoughts about data use. Before I do that, does anyone have any questions about the, the task at hand? Okay, we'll have a great conversation. We'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. Hi, everybody. Morning. <clears throat> Excuse me, morning. Morning. How is everyone? Good. Great. Um, so the conversation, I'm um, just around the data use. What are ways that you're using data to, to work, um, work in these pathways uh, where you are? You all there? Hi, Rock. Welcome. <laughs> Hi everybody, can you all hear me? I, I'm not sure if it's me or not. <laughs> Gustavo, Nadia, Henry, Margie, are you all here? Margie, are you here? I thought I heard your voice. Henry? Can you hear me? I'm here. This is Henry. I 
can hear you now. Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Are we having technical issues here? <laughs> Margie, Gustavo, are you there? Mike Henry? Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello, hello. Hello, Henry. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I was. I can't hear you, but you can hear me. Okay. I I don't know if I'm. I'm just worried know. my tech, my tech issues are m messing us all up. But yeah, I think I think the uh, we can hear you, but we couldn't like speak in because I was trying to unmute myself and mute myself back and forth. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, that's so, okay. Where are, you, where are you coming from? Uh, Santa Cruz. Ah. So how are you, how how do you see data being used well where you are? Yeah. So uh, pretty much what the conversation earlier in regards to uh, the labor market. Um, that's what what uh, we have been doing with. Uh, Cabrillo College is our local college here. So, you know, we try to kind of work backwards to see what the, the labor market demands are. And then mm -hmm. uh, we're actually developing a new pathway uh, for uh, computer technology. And, and that's, that was brought forth through that data that we used from uh, meeting with the high schools and the junior colleges. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah, how, how has that helped you, you all? Yes. Well, well, it's really uh, helped us just zone in on what the needs are for our community. Mm. Um, so we can actually zone in on, you know, what the needs are it's specifically for not only that, but also um, doing surveys on what the students want, the interests of the students mm. uh, um, at the high school level and at the college level. Okay, great. How about you, Margie? Yeah. How about... Hey. I hope others aren't having this problem with this technical issue is big. Um, yeah, I I'm know. So sorry. How many people are in this, in this, in this break of... Well, it looks like some of some people. You might have gotten a message, um, maybe Henry or Gustavo, um, to join a breakout room. Maybe that's what's going on. Um, did you get a message that popped oh, up? Oh, okay. Join a breakout. No, I didn't. Oh, how oh, weird. You know what? I didn't. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's. These are the. You folks are the ones that may, maybe hadn't joined yet. Oh, I see. But so I'm, that was. So we're the ones that blew it on iron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so funny. This technology so, is such a... Is it, it's probably too late to... Yeah, no, go ahead and join, join, join the room, room right? Well, no, I, I'm not hearing anyone else speak on this call. So go ahead and join, Henry, and maybe you can get okay, some then. conversation. Yeah, for sure. Okay, great. We'll be okay, back thanks. in a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks.
that was the first time I was put actually put into a breakout room. So I got to see what my students have to go through. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Empathy. Great. I think we have most folks back. Janine, thank you. <laughs> you read my mind. How was that conversation? What did you learn? Anyone want to unmute and share? Well, I feel like we maybe learned that some of us have the same challenges when collecting data. Some of us have the same needs as far as trying to find um, a data system or data collection uh, availability, I guess, and uh, how to collect data uh, that is beneficial and useful. Like we were talking about CalPass, CalPass Plus and having a training um, with that, or is there another system of collecting data that would be more beneficial for all of us, especially in the CTE realm? Good, wonderful. We had a conversation about an ongoing data collection issue that was identified almost two years ago by the CTIG technical assistance people. And that is that our ROP JPAs, our ROPs at the county and our county offices in the K-12 side do not upload data into CalPADS. So therefore we cannot have data uploaded into CalPASS Plus. And we haven't really seen much movement on trying to get that issue resolved over the last year or two. And it precedes Sandra, so I don't know where it fits on you know, her to-do list. It was, it was definitely a Matt Roberts uh, conversation for the last year and a half that we've been trying to get resolved as we go forward. And we know that in some of our areas, the ROPs and the JPAs, ROPs were the leads on a lot of K-12 grants because of the one-to-one -one match opportunity if that was your fiscal agent. So it's gonna snowball into a big problem when we have to actually start reporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first to having folks say that's a, it's a really good point. Thank you, Valerie. Maybe a couple more comments, um, things that came up in the room that benefit the group. I can share a couple that came up in the breakout group I was in. This is Janine um, again, and uh, our, our group was pretty sophisticated in the data department, it seemed. Um, and we talked about a couple of threads, one around the CCI and how important that's been to raise the profile of CTE and the importance of CTE completion or pathway completion um, for local dialogue. Um, second was around thinking really carefully about um, uh, information and coding. Um, so that, and there's was some discussion about how within CalPa uh, CalPass Plus and some other systems that errors in coding can lead to different and wrongful conclusions. And so that's been an introspective look within some um, places. And then third um, was around uh, really thinking carefully about transition supports and um, counseling services offered to students and um, looking at data to help um, sort of substantiate the need for support in that area, but also to facilitate and support students in, as they make their journeys. Um, and so it was a it was a compelling conversation. And I, especially on the counseling side, I would love to lo learn more in the future. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. So I want to make sure that folks um, take an opportunity just to, to jot down a few points. If these are going to go into our notes, and we can um, we can kind of understand what where you all are at with this conversation in the field. If you want to put them in chat. Um, that would be very helpful, even if you did not um, share with the larger group. So we had, because we had over 15 groups, I think we had 16 or 17 breakout groups. It was, it was a lot of conversations happening. So um, although we can't kind of capture it now, we'd love to get a feel for the, the pulse um, around data um, in the field. Um, so a couple other points we just want to cover. Um, uh, we are interested in so we have a, a one slide about kind of other resources that we want to make sure people are aware about um we've talked a couple times about a launch board there is one around the cte transition tab there are others in development around um, k-12 strong workforce actually there's also the cc pipeline that's very helpful um so if you don't know launch board we welcome that um uh, you can enter it through calpass plus um and launch board is, is attached to it 
Um, we also had John yesterday talking, uh, Carice, uh, from Centers of Excellence. If you don't know who Centers of Excellence are in your region, we definitely encourage you to get to know their resources. Um, you all have regional um, um, representatives and directors, so um, they're a huge benefit for the community college system, and we uh, definitely think that folks could um, strengthen pathways by getting better labor market information that they have available to them. We have some really ex amazing examples of folks um, across the state uh, partnering with Centers of Excellence for the K-12 pathways and really doing amazing work, especially around um, skill development and skill transitions. So um, definitely utilize them as a resource. Um, there's also, as you all have mentioned several times, the dashboard uh, from CDE, including the, the, the CCI, the College and Career Indicator. I'm seeing some of the comments in the chat that there is um, uh, some real um, um, opportunities around the CCI indicator, uh, bridging the conversations in the field between C, um, kind of the, the CTE coursework and the A to G and other folks that are working on um, college and career. We, we definitely, at least in our little team um, at West, had really wanna um, think a lot about how these conversations can be um, um, leveraged and enhanced and connected to one another. Um, as um, Sharon shared in her data, um, slide from Santa Cruz. Um, there's some outcomes that happen with pathway students that are not obviously directly linked to the pathway they choose in college, but um, there's a lot of um, emerging data around retention and, and completion of, of pathway students. So we want to keep learning together about what the benefits are of, of your pathways um, into college and career. Um, obviously, most of you that are at the K-12, you all know CalPADS um, already, but certainly a resource for you all um, to understand the patterns of um, your students. Are there other resources that we wanna make sure we lift up now before we keep, um, we have lots of examples. I know we tried to keep it fairly brief on this slide, but if there's other examples, if you can put them in the chat, we'll make sure we add them um, to the notes and, and we'll procure some more resources for the, the resource uh, Google Doc. Um, uh, Rachel, I see a couple of great comments in here. Mm -hmm. So someone's saying, uh, Taryn is saying DataQuest is a great site. Um, seeing um, some additional questions, which I'll circle back on as well. And then Bob offering to share an infographic that might be valuable to others. Um, I would like to commit us, um, and I think our emails are on the next slide, um, to uh, package this and send out uh, materials afterwards. If there are things that folks want to share with this group, we can consolidate them and make sure they're available. Um, so feel free to um, email that to us, Bob. Um, I think there's, there's also a question that keeps coming up around um, the difference between CalPads and CalPass Plus. I know it's alphabet soup. Um, it took me a good six months to figure out what all these things were when I first um, began in this world. Um, and so in this transition space between the two. CalPADS is the CDE data system um, that collected statewide um, that uh, covers more than CTE only, but covers all the courses and uh, student information. It's a huge data system. Um, CalPASS Plus is the linkage of information from K-12 districts to the community college version of CalPADS, the MIS system. And so it's a transitions database. It, it covers the, the movement between the two systems. Um, it's not, compre it's not um, you know, 100% uh, there are, it is a great tool and has a mm -hmm. development continuing on it. Um, it doesn't capture everybody, um, but it captures a lot of students. Um, and so uh, that is, I think, a conversation that is um, it is a great tool, and I think Tanya shared an information session that was available around CalPASS Plus um, in the chat, so we'll make sure that that goes out in the subsequent communications as well. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll try to consolidate some of these. Yes, and, and just, um, I know we're coming up on time. We're going to hand it back over to, to Lila, but I, I wanted to just mention um, that the, the plan from here on out um, in terms of the, the K-12 um, Strong Workforce interim measures is um, to keep disseminating um, the information through the regional chairs and your K-14 TAPS. Um, uh, we have um, um, other kind of the channels that we've created um, to get the feedback is kind of the same way we're trying to get disseminate more information out. Um, there might be new channels that are created now that you all are on this call, but that I just want to make sure that you all know who we're talking with and the deeper kind of data that um, uh, elements that, that Janine described can be um, procured and discussed with your regional um, chairs and um, consortia chairs, as well as your, your TAP. Um, if you don't have a TAP, then you defer to the, 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 your regional consortia chair. Um, we're obviously open to, to questions as well. Um, the next slide has our contact information for 
um, Tara, myself, and, um, and Janine um, welcome any communication that is needed. We'll, we'll do our best to procure some um, good resources for you all for, based on these comments. You have some great ideas that there's so much that we could gather from 100 people working in the field. It's incredible. Um, so uh, we'll do our best to, to try to um, sync this information up. Um, Melissa just posted a survey for this session. We'd love to get your feedback about how we did um, um, and uh, improve as we move forward because that's what data does, right? So thanks everyone.